We come then to what the Bible calls Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. Although the New Testament only contained two letters to the Corinthians, the evidence from these two letters is that he wrote at least four. In chapter 5 of the first biblical letter, he refers to a letter he had previously written to them, warning them not to associate with sexually immoral people. Then, in this second letter, he refers to an earlier letter of tears he had written. 1 Corinthians does not match that description, so this letter of tears may have been written between 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, although some scholars believe at least part of it is the final four chapters of 2 Corinthians, possibly initially added as an appendix. The first several chapters of this letter appear to have been written some time after the painful letter was received and accepted by the church. This letter contains an expression of gratitude for the change that has taken place among the Corinthian believers. Paul rejoices that they are now on the right track once again, and he summarises for them the essential meaning of the gospel that he first proclaimed to them. Paul tells the church that the Christian gospel is none other than the new covenant, written not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Paul opens the book with praise to God of all comfort. He mentions his suffering and the consolation he has in Christ. He had been delivered by God from desperate troubles and even a sentence of death in Asia. In fact, he faced so much opposition, the reason Paul did not visit Corinth was to spare them. It has been said, never doubt in the dark what you learned in the light. Yet, when we go through times of trial, we lose sight of what we believe. We have a tendency to see only the problems. We need to see God's purpose in our suffering. Paul and his companions didn't deserve to suffer, and yet they did, to the point, Paul says, where they despaired of life itself. When we go through unwarranted suffering, or when we see someone else suffer, we find ourselves asking God why he lets bad things happen to good people. The fact is that we live in a fallen world. The reason innocent people suffer is that this is not the world God created it to be. The fact is we live in a fractured fallen world and because of that all people suffer. Paul emphasises all God has done and is doing through Jesus Christ to restore his fallen world. If we lived in a perfect world, there would be no need for a message of salvation. But because the world is broken, people need to hear about the one, the only one, who can repair things and make everything whole again. God shows us his design for our lives. He wants us to depend not on circumstances, but rather on him. Paul says that he and those with him despaired of life itself and felt that they had received a sentence of death. Then he tells us why. It is so that we would rely not on ourselves but on God who raises the dead. This is God's design for our lives. There is a third sign of God's good purpose in our afflictions and it is that through them God strengthens our faith in him. Paul says, in him we have set our hope that, we will, that he will rescue us again. He was strengthened in his faith. There's one more way we see the good in our reflections. God equips us to minister to others in their suffering. In fact, Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all consolation, who consoles us in our affliction, so that we may be able to console those who are in any affliction with the consolation with which we ourselves are consoled by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are abundant for us, so also our consolation is abundant through Christ. We can console others in their trials because of what Christ suffered consoles us in ours.
The Corinthian church was situated in a city that was morally corrupt, and its influence was showing up in negative ways within the church. Paul's authority came into question among some within the church, and it seems that he was forced to deal with one issue after another. Facing such adversity and opposition, it would have been easy to have grown discouraged. Some would have been tempted to abandon the work altogether. However, Paul refuses to give up on Corinth. He chose to focus on the possibilities for growth, rather than the many obstacles the work there presented. Paul decided to consider the opportunities instead of the opposition. Like Paul, we too must focus on the opportunities we have instead of the increasing opposition. Paul had expectations as he faced the challenges. He speaks of a day of opportunity. This wasn't exactly what Paul had planned, and yet he sought opportunity to serve the Lord. He speaks of arriving in Troas, a city in Asia Minor, east of Corinth, on the opposite side of the Aegean Sea. He came with the intent of preaching the gospel, and God was faithful to open a door for him to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Paul rejoiced at the fruitful ministry at Troas and in God providing opportunities to preach. He didn't sit and wait for an opportunity to present itself. He went to Troas intent to share the gospel. Paul had sent Titus to Corinth, bearing the first letter written to the church there, with the anticipation of meeting him again in Troas. When Paul arrived in Troas, Titus was not there. This caused great concern, troubling the spirit of Paul. He was anxious to hear a report from Titus regarding the well-being of the church in Corinth. Clearly, Paul is deeply burdened for the church, and desired to know if things had improved. The plan was to meet Titus in Troas, but Paul refused to allow this issue to hinder his focus in ministry. Having met the current need in Troas, he went on to Macedonia to minister to the Philippian church. Paul refused to allow a momentary setback to dictate his course of action. Although things had not gone as planned, he was determined to continue in ministry. Such perseverance requires faith and committed resolve, and is necessary if we are to be faithful to the Lord. When adversity comes, or plans change suddenly, we must adapt to the current situation and press on for the Lord. There's too much at stake to allow an inconvenience or personal setback to hinder our service for the Lord and the Gospel. Paul remained optimistic about his ministry, even in the face of difficulty. Regardless of what we face in life or ministry, we can always be optimistic in Christ. We are victorious through him, even in the face of difficulty. He secured our victory over sin and death as he died to redeem us and rose again in resurrection life. Paul's plans may have changed, but the Lord remained faithful to him. Paul rejoiced that God was not limited to a particular place or region. He could provide opportunities and bring about salvation wherever he pleased. We need to be reminded of God's faithfulness to his word and his commitment to the lost and perishing. If we are faithful to follow the direction of the Lord wherever he leads, he will be faithful to equip us and provide the results he desires. Paul's committed service would be noticed by others in the church. Although he faced challenges, his commitment would encourage others in the faith. His perseverance would allow him to be a blessing to the church, helping equip others for ministry. As we live our lives faithfully for Christ, we impact the lives of others. As we live our lives for Christ, 
among those who have yet to respond to the gospel, we bear witness for the Lord and of their need for him. Our lives reveal resurrection life in Christ and also bear witness of the dead condition of the unsaved. Finally, Paul reveals the need for committed obedience while serving the Lord. Paul posed a sobering question. Who is sufficient to be a witness for Christ, literally producing a sweet fragrance for him? Paul knew, apart from Christ, none could provide an effective witness. Only those who were totally committed to the Lord, completely surrendered to his will for their lives, could produce such a fragrance. Paul wanted those in the church to ponder their lives and discern whether they produced such a fragrance. It was possible, but it required faith and commitment, even in the face of increased doubt and speculation regarding the word. We must be faithful to the word and continue to present it to a world that doesn't desire it, but desperately needs it. Many had corrupted the word, refusing to conform to its holy standard, while trying to pervert its doctrines to conform to the desires of men. Paul remained committed to the word and refused to depart from it. He sought a life of purity and righteousness before the Lord, seeking to point men to Jesus Christ, the sole means of salvation. His heart was fixed on the gospel. He had no other message to share. Paul's enemies hated him because he was not one of them. Paul would not do as they had done, pervert the gospel to fit their own ideological agendas. His enemies treated him disrespectfully and dismissively. Who do you think you are? Paul argued that the authentication of any ministry lies in its obvious positive impact on the lives of people. There were Corinthians whose lives had been transformed by the gospel of Christ because their hearts had been inscribed not with ink but with the Spirit of God all because of Paul's testimony and preaching. Recipients of, and responders to, the gospel preached by Paul were indeed living letters of recommendation. They were living proof that God was working through Paul's ministry to bring about good. Christians are the only Bibles that some people will ever read. We're not called to write for God, but to let God write through us, thereby making an indelible impression on the minds and hearts of people searching for answers to the dilemmas in which they find themselves. We may not know what the answer is, but we do know who. No one is personally adequate to carry on the ministry of the Spirit. Adequacy comes from God. God not only sent himself to us, he sent himself into us. As believers, we have the spirit of the living God residing in our hearts. He empowers you and me with competence and confidence. The key to knowing that our faith is real and that, therefore, the epistle we are writing glorifies Jesus Christ is that we are seeking to make a difference in the lives of others because we want to, not because we have to. Let us enter into a new commitment to be about our Father's business, loving, forgiving, sharing, caring in the Spirit of Christ, in the name of Jesus and to the glory of God. Paul knew a little bit about how to keep going when you can't go on. He said he was troubled on every side, yet not distressed. The word troubled means to crowd. He experienced troubles and trials to the point where it was all closing in on him. Yet Paul said, although I'm crowded, I'm not crushed. He then said he was doubting. 
but not despairing. The word perplexed means to have no way out. There were times in his life he literally felt at a loss. Yet he said, I'm not in despair. Literally, Paul said, there are times when I feel at a loss, but not totally at a loss. He was filled with doubt about what was going to happen. He may have been full of questions, but he refused to be in despair and despondent. He then said he was persecuted, but not forsaken. The word persecuted would be better translated as to be pursued or followed. To be forsaken means to be deserted or left behind. Everywhere that Paul went, it seemed that trouble followed him. He was threatened, imprisoned, faced death on several occasions. Yet, he said, I'm not forsaken. Finally, he claimed he was knocked down, but not destroyed. He had been cast down, knocked off his feet, but not destroyed as a result. Or, if you like, he had been knocked down, but not knocked out. How did Paul maintain this kind of attitude in spite of his adversity? How can we keep going when we can't go on? Faith will keep us going when we can't go on. We know that after death, Jesus is going to raise us up. But that same resurrection power is able to lift us up now. Lift us up above sin, above our sorrows, above the shadows. In all of our darkness, distress, disease and disturbance, remember that Jesus lives. We can only live after death through him. But we have the power to live now. We must make certain where our focus is. If our focus is not correct, then we will have trouble pressing on. Paul then talks of the earthly house, by which he means our physical bodies, which will be destroyed in time. But there is the reassurance that we have a heavenly house made by God. When we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Physical deterioration reminds us of the brevity of life. When we pass from these bodies to the world beyond, we must each give an account before the judgment seat of Christ, according to what we have done, whether good or bad. Life in heaven is an embodied life. People who go to heaven don't become ghosts or extraterrestrial spirit beings, or even angel-like. There will also be some continuity between our present bodies and those we will have in heaven. Life in heaven is shown in the Bible to be in relationship with others. It will be a time of intimate sharing with close friends and family. It will be a celebration. Living in a perfect city with no crime, no homelessness, no unemployment, no corruption, no pollution, no civil unrest, no prejudice and no terrorism. Fairness and truth will be the norm. Goodness will be second nature. Morality will reign. The kingdom of our new home is a victorious one. When a kingdom is victorious, it means the battle is over and there is no more war of any kind. Anyone in Christ is a new creation. We are reconciled to God in Christ. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. No one in heaven is a failure. In heaven, everyone is morally perfect. The only people who dwell in heaven are the righteous who have been made perfect. Everything there will be centred on God, as John records in the book of Revelation. Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he shall live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God.
The Apostle Paul said we put no stumbling block in anyone's path. Paul was not the first to talk about stumbling blocks. Jesus, speaking to the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, said, Woe to you, because you shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. In his frustration, at one point, Jesus even said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are a stumbling block to me. Paul now says you have to make up your mind not to be a stumbling block or obstacle in anyone's path. He adds that the reason not to put a stumbling block in anyone's path is so that our ministry will not be discredited. Paul was very careful about this, even to the point that he said it's wrong to eat or drink anything that may cause someone else to stumble. Don't be a stumbling block. Because if you do, your ministry will be discredited. Your testimony will be weakened and people will no longer follow you. Paul then states that as servants of God, they commend themselves in every way. When you commend someone for something, you make them look good. You find a quality in someone, like faithfulness or kindness or humility, or whatever it may be, and then you commend them for it. But Paul is saying here, commend yourself. Give yourself a pat on the back. Why? Because you're a servant. A true disciple has followers, and people will follow you in direct proportion to your ability to handle hardship and difficulty. People aren't looking to follow someone whose life has the appearance of being trouble-free, because they know that that life doesn't exist. Paul lists difficult situations where, if we handle these trials properly, people will follow. In great endurance, in troubles, hardship and distresses, in beatings, imprisonments and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights and hunger. People will follow others if their lives are a reflection of Jesus Christ. The Apostle then speaks in opposites, a bad report, a good report, poor but rich, has nothing but has everything. I believe what Paul is saying is summed up in one word, perspective, how we see things. This is what psychologists refer to as a paradigm shift. It means we see things one way, but then we suddenly see the same things in a different way. When you can learn to live that way, people will want to follow. On the other hand, if you don't live that way, no one will follow. Through the difficulties you face, live for Christ and every day point people to the Lord Jesus Christ. There is great need for encouragement these days as we see so many disturbances, trials and tribulations in the lives of God's people all over the world. Some are going through unspeakable tragedies in their personal family and professional lives. The spiritual condition of many churches is disappointing to many believers and they're losing heart and interest to attend church or meet with other believers for fellowship. Everybody needs encouragement but where can we find it? In chapter 7 we find the word encouragement or encourage repeated six times. This is a passage full of encouragement, and Paul lists seven ways in which we can find encouragement. First and foremost, we find encouragement from God. It's God who comforts us in all of our tribulations, and comes in time to encourage us and to lift us up from our discouragement and depressions. Paul testifies to this, but God, who encourages those who are discouraged, encouraged us by the uh, arrival of Titus. He'd already said in the first chapter, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, 
and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted by God. Secondly, God's word is full of encouraging words. As we read, meditate and study his word, we get encouraged. Paul says, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Sharing God's word can be encouraging to one another. The words of the Lord Jesus bring joy to the hearts that are discouraged. We get encouraged from God's people, our brothers and sisters. Paul was much encouraged by the Corinthians and by Titus as well. God has given us his people in the church to encourage one another. Gathering is not just to meet our social needs or maintain membership in the church. We gather together so that we are available to encourage one another as we also need the same. We can be encouraged from our situations. Sometimes God arranges or puts us in situations where we get encouraged when we are badly in need of it. For example, Paul was much encouraged by the arrival of Titus. At the right time, Titus came and brought encouraging news from Corinth to Paul. Let us trust the Lord to make all things work together for our good, so that we are encouraged when we feel down or discouraged. We can be encouraged from the positive response of others. Paul was encouraged to see how the believers at Corinth responded to his letter with true repentance. The church at Corinth showed much love and care for Paul. and This encouraged and uplifted the spirit of the apostle. We can be encouraged from the good we have done. We're encouraged when we see our good work bearing fruit and resulting in transforming others. So keep doing good work so that they will encourage you one day. And you need to encourage yourselves at times, since you're given all the resources in your relationship with Christ. God has enriched us in everything so that we can encourage ourselves when we are discouraged. Paul was able to encourage himself in the Lord. If you want to learn how to do anything well, you need to follow the example of an expert. Paul cites the Macedonian Christians as a great example of generosity, being supportive, displaying liberality and joy in affliction. Out of their extreme poverty, they gave. And their giving was beyond their ability. They didn't just give the minimum. They gave their maximum and astounded Paul by the blessedness of their gifts. So much so that he lifted them up as an example to the church at Corinth that was rich in people, things and money. Paul hopes that the Corinthians will be as generous in giving for the Christians in Jerusalem. Christ was rich and yet for our sakes he became poor. Therefore through his poverty we might become rich. The abundance of the Corinthian church should relieve the lack of the Jerusalem Christians. Paul commends Titus as a trustworthy bearer of their money. The financial assistance will be a proof of their love. The nature of God is to examine the sincerity of our love for him. When, God told, when Jesus told a parable on what sincerity of love meant, he directed the people's attention to a widow who gave out of her poverty, and he lifted her giving as an example of righteousness. Jesus sacrificed everything to demonstrate the sincerity of his love for God and for us. This dimension of love is truly love in action. 
we manifest the authenticity that you love the Lord by living and by giving. Loving sincerely means that you live and give. Giving is not determined by the amount of a gift. It's not about money. Giving is determined by one's response to God's grace. It really is a condition of the heart. In both of his letters to the church at Corinth, Paul is dealing with the authenticity and sincerity of their love for God. To love sincerely, you must first give yourself to the Lord. Paul uses a Greek word, adiomai, which means to have respect for or to stand in awe of, in other words, reverence. Loving sincerely is a dimension of reverence. One of our challenges is that we, in our giving and loving, we connect the sincerity of our love to our own sense of self-satisfaction. The truth of the matter is that when you love sincerely, it's a dimension of reverence. When you love sincerely, your gift is really being given to God, even though it may be given through some earthly channel. If God is love, we are to love God completely. Then all manifestations of our love must be sincere and must be to honour God. That's the test of loving and giving. Why do you love and why do you give? If it's for some purpose other than to honour God, then Paul is suggesting you're missing the meaning of God's grace. Jesus, who was rich, became poor for our sakes, so that out of his poverty we could become rich. Loving sincerely is truly a dimension of reverence to God. Paul introduces another idea. The idea that loving and giving is connected to freedom, true freedom for Paul, is only found in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, who frees us from sin and death. When we accept that Jesus Christ died for us, then loving sincerely frees us up to allow the Holy Spirit to work in us and through us in service of God. The grace of Jesus Christ permits us to love and to give sincerely. As Christians, we're called to be disciples of Jesus Christ, which means we're to grow through the practice of certain spiritual disciplines, Bible study, prayer, witnessing, forgiveness, and the disciplines of stewardship and giving. God is the owner of all things, and has entrusted part of what belongs to him to us to manage as he directs. We cannot outgive God. If we sow generously, we'll reap generously. And that is the nature of the harvest. Paul says it's a harvest of righteousness. In other words, as I grow in the grace of giving, I'll be more like Jesus. Specifically, as I grow in the grace of giving, I'll grow in my appreciation of God's love. I give anything beyond a tithe. That's because that's what God has revealed to me through prayer. And when I grow in giving by obeying God's direction concerning my tithe first, then my offerings, I will grow in my appreciation of the love of God. The nature of God's love for us was expressed through giving. God showed his love by giving of himself unhesitatingly, willingly and enthusiastically in Christ. Likewise, we grow to appreciate the love of God as we, in response to the call of a holy God, decide to give of ourselves unhesitatingly, willingly and enthusiastically. Paul emphasises the sufficiency of the grace of God. He makes it clear that we respond to God's call to give in support of his work 
through his church. We will not lack anything we need. The same apostle who testified that God's grace was sufficient to sustain him in times of trial and sickness also testifies that God's grace is sufficient to supply our needs. We learn by experience that God's grace is always sufficient. God has power to provide for our obedience. God prospers me not to raise my standard of living, but to raise my standard of giving. Where God guides, he'll provide. What he commands, he'll enable. God never asks us to do something that we can't do by his power. So we should never be shocked at any command God gives us. But God's provision for your giving will only be revealed after you choose to obey. Until then, you likely may not recognise God's supply. If we're to give as God directs, it will likely involve rearranging priorities, making different choices, adopting different habits, and even making certain sacrifices. But, in the process, you'll discover by experience the power and provision of God, and you will grow to be more like Jesus, make the choice to obey his call, and let him reorganise your life and reveal his supply. And God will make you rich in every way, so that you can live the generous life. In the final part of the letter, believed by many to be actually a separate letter, Paul defends himself and his work to the charges made against him by his enemies, including the Jewish legalists, who said that Paul was an imposter who had not been authorised by the proper authorities to work among the churches. The legalists supported their charge by pointing out that Paul had a thorn in his flesh, some physical defect that, according to ancient Jewish regulations, would have barred a man from the priesthood. While we do not know what that is, many believe it was possibly failing eyesight. The opponents further maintain that God supported himself in doing manual labour rather than accepting support from the members of the church. This labour, in their judgment, was an admission on his part that he was not qualified to be supported in the way that was customary for duly authorised missionaries. Legalists also accused Paul of cowardice on the grounds that he was bold so long as he was writing letters, but he was very mild when present with the legalists in person. Paul faces the accusation that he's tough in his letters but weak and unimpressive in person. He says if they wish, he can be equally tough in person. Other charges of a similar nature were made in an all-out attempt to discredit the religious work that Paul was doing. Paul does not minister according to the flesh. Paul's critics measure themselves by themselves. Paul will not boast in anything he does, stating, He who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Paul says that your attitude is the lens through which you see and filter everything in life. If the worldview is Christian and godly, then your thinking, your conscience and your actions will be. However, if the worldview is worldly, unchristian, materialistic, then your thinking, conscience and actions will reflect that. The most prevailing worldview today is entitlement. We are entitled to certain things, whether or not we deserve them. Such a worldview can be deeply entrenched and nearly impossible to demolish. Some of the strongholds that can grip Christians include fear, resentment, bitterness, lack of forgiveness, apathy, depression, anxiety, lukewarmness, lust, pride greed, 
alcohol, pornography, prejudice, discrimination, materialism, homosexuality, meism, and so many more. Satan has no power to take your territory, your mind, your heart, but he can squat on any territory that you willingly surrender. And when you do, he gets a foothold, an opening. You surrender an area of your mind or life to him. When Satan gets enough of these footholds in your territory, your nature, your worldview, your conscience, all become evil. Before you became a Christian, when you were living in the flesh and putting up no resistance, Satan established footholds in your life, your mind, your territory. Once Satan has a foothold, he knows that the Holy Spirit is lurking around, trying to call you to God. So he fortifies these footholds and they become strongholds. Satan definitely knows if you become a Christian, there is nothing he can do to snatch your soul from God's hand. When you trust in Christ, you get a new nature and a new mission. But, and this is huge, Satan knows that though he's lost your eternal soul, your flesh is still very much at his disposal. How does Satan fortify a foothold and make it a stronghold? He wants to fortify the foothold. He gets you, the human owner of the territory, to do the work for him by compromise. Now, before you get saved, you did not have any conflict with this. You were doing what made you happy, what you wanted to do. Satan was just a welcome guest. So how are we going to get rid of these strongholds? You have to stop strengthening the stronghold. Strongholds cannot be reasoned away, will not just go away. They have to be torn down and demolished, mourn and weep, repent, submit, purify. Some people are generally weak in most areas of life. Others are strong in some areas, but weak in the spiritual realm because, deep down, they really don't believe things like doctrine are important. Paul attempts to shake up both types of people who are inappropriately tolerant. Spiritual gullibility is dangerous. Our aim must be faithfulness, and there is a great danger of deception. Paul reflects back to the Garden of Eden and that first deception perpetrated by the serpent. The command that God gave was simple and easy to understand. Do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. People are often led away because of insincerity. They want to please others or go along with society. Christians who are gullible just don't think content is important. Like Eve, they are open to interpretations other than God's word. Like Adam, they follow others into wrong with wide open eyes. Being tolerant of professing believers who deny the essentials is mindless. When Paul confronted them, they labelled him as unchristlike. The issue was who and what the people wanted to believe, and how that compared to the truth. Godly Christians expect a measure of control within the church. The church is not a public forum. It does not and should not give equal time to those who oppose what the church believes. The church is a family, and its family members are out to protect and to develop one another. There is good news and bad news about prayer. The good news is that God answers prayer. The bad news is that sometimes his answer is no. We don't expect that from God. We assume that God waits in anticipation for our next request and that we're entitled to receive whatever we ask for. <laughs> 
So what happens if God's answer to prayer is no? The church at Corinth were troubled by boastful attitudes. Boasting about one's position or relationship with Christ had become a cause of disagreement between many of the believers and worsened as some claimed to have received special revelations from God. This boasting was dividing the church into two groups, the haves and the have-nots. Such class distinctions are destructive in the church and Paul knows it. Paul uses this opportunity to teach the young believers and takes an interesting approach in his teaching. He tells of a man who has had a revelation so spectacular it cannot be topped by anyone. In fact, this man has heard inexpressible things which man is not permitted to tell. This man heard these things as he was caught up into the third heaven or paradise. Now, Jews believe there were seven degrees of heaven, which explains why Yahweh is sometimes referred to as residing above the heavens. Interestingly, Paul tells the story about himself while writing in the third person. Indeed, it is Paul who had this spectacular revelation, and it was not the Damascus Road experience, but another entirely separate incident. This extraordinary experience could easily have puffed Paul up. This revelation gave him insight and understanding, unknown to anyone to whom he writes. Interestingly, and directly connected to this event, is an affliction that enters his life. Paul said that he was given a thorn in his flesh to torment him. The deliverer was a messenger of Satan, strong words from a man of God. In Paul's mind, this thorn was to prevent him from becoming conceited or boastful about the great revelations God had given him. Paul asked God to remove it, and God said no. In fact, God said no three times. Too often we see God's actions on our terms. On our terms, Paul is entitled to have this thorn taken away from him. But God sees it differently. Paul had great visions and revelations. The power of his ministry was not in his own charisma, but in God's power. The benefit of this is obvious. Man's power is limited, but God's is not. Therefore, God could accomplish his work and will both through Paul and in spite of Paul. So Paul concluded that is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul saw his thorn as a gift from God. Notice his choice of words. There was given me a thorn in the flesh, not sent to me, or I was inflicted. It was given to me, so that I would not boast in my own power, but boast in God's power in me. God had revealed himself many times to Paul, sharing great insight into his character, his will, and his love. Had God never shown interest in him, Paul's response would have been different, reminding ourselves of God's character and his heart for us, carries us when God says no to a particular request. Saying no does not reflect on our standing with God, but on our status with God. Where he wants us now on the pathway of spiritual maturity, when God spoke, Paul listened. Instead of moaning loudly about God not answering his prayer in the way he had hoped, Paul listened closely to what was hidden in God's answer. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. If Paul had only heard no, he would have missed the point of God's answer. Paul trusted God completely, saying, 
Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. God didn't say no to Paul because he didn't love him or care about his troubles, or because he was annoyed with him. He said no so that Paul wouldn't fall into the same trap as his opponents, placing too much confidence in his own ability while diminishing God's role. In the final chapter, Paul challenged the Corinthians, examine yourselves to see if you're holding to your faith. Test yourselves. Don't you realise that Jesus Christ is in you? It's important for those of us who are Christians to examine ourselves spiritually. We need to examine our inner motives and gauge our behaviour and attitudes periodically to see if they match the person and spirit of Christ. It's often easier for us to blame someone or something else than to take responsibility for ourselves. It's all too human for us to do this rather than look within and search for the real answers when things go wrong. Sometimes we look outside ourselves for answers to our problems. We can look pretty foolish. Jesus once told his disciples, the kingdom of God is within you. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory, who's the answer to your most perplexing problems. Don't look outside yourself. Begin to find the answer by looking within your own heart and soul. This is what Paul is telling us. No one else can give an answer outside of God, and no one else knows your heart and motives as you do. It's Christ in you who is the answer. Never forget that. If you would like to know more, then do contact us at any of the contact addresses given on this slide. Or, if you're in the Radstock area one Sunday morning, want to come and join us for a half past ten service at the Baptist Church. You will always be very welcome. <laughs>